Hi everybody, Jacob here. Welcome back to the Fashion Bunker. Super excited to do a top 10 80s perfumes or the top 10 perfumes from the 80s, according to me at least. The ones that I love the most, the ones that have anchored themselves into my memory, my heart, my soul, my subconscious and my conscious self. But of course, it wouldn't be the 80s if I wouldn't have other passions as well, like my passion for 80s slasher horror movies, which bring me to my merch. So I have to mention that too before we get to the video. I have released this perfume-related spooky Halloween merch, which is a limited edition available only until the 31st of October of this year, until Halloween. And it's called Jacob the Extract. It's, in a, it's a vision of a perfume that I've created. The perfume hasn't been created yet, but the advertising campaign has already been created. So you could see here an example of the pumpkin bottle that has a little sprayer nozzle on top. When you spray it, the whole world turns into this psychedelic vision. Anyway, in the back of the hoodie, you could see a little bit. You can't really see it. But, uh, the but if you go on the website, you could see the whole on my fashion bunker shop the link will be pinned at the top of the comment section down below it will be in the description box and you could also slide the bar underneath this video where you could see uh, some of the pieces you click on on the link and it takes you oh my hair is so long and it takes you straight to the fashion bunker shop there you could see the front and the back prints of the hoodies crewnecks t-shirts mugs and stickers take of the extract limited time only it is a perfume related halloween and Halloween never smelled better. In fact, even the 80s never smelled better. I have to say, uh, the 80s definitely deliver a punch. They are a powerhouse time. A lot of people that review fragrances are gonna, when they start reviewing any fragrance from the 80s, they're gonna say, this is a powerhouse fragrance. Yeah, some of them were not as powerhouse as others. Some of them had a little subtlety to them. But truth be told, the 80s were carefree times. We did have the Cold War kind of pending like a doom on top of us. And there was a lot of issues in the world as well. But nevertheless, there was a certain type of joie de vivre, you know, like a happiness of life of living that really, I think 2020 could not be further ruh, 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 from what the 80s were in terms of that joie de vivre. And Fragrance has completely reflected that. In fact, the fragrances that are released today are all meh. Most of them are meh. Little waterlets, little water thingies that uh, brands just, you know, just like give them to us, sprinkle them all over us and thinking like, here, let them use, the, let them eat cake, basically. That's how these brands are treating us consumers lately. Perhaps after 2020, things will change. In the 80s, however, brands were treating us like queens and kings. Samples were thrown at you at the malls. You would be gifted amazing gift baskets with a purchase of a fragrance and a body lotion or just of a fragrance. The quantities were substantial. The packaging was to die for. The bottle designs were to die for. And the prices were not as high as today. Today, you got to buy something to get a sample. And the sample is one milliliter. Back in the day, they would give you 10 milliliter, five, four milliliter was the smallest sample. One milliliter, really? Or these stupid samples that they give out now, which is like a little cardboard paper. You got to pull it out and then it like sprays one spritz on you and that's it. No, it costs them more money to produce these little paper cards with the sprayer things than it does to actually give you a freaking two milliliter spray sample, at least two milliliter. But those are the times we live in. Stingy, stingy, sad times. It's almost like the Middle Ages in many respects. I know the Middle Ages have been proven to be, to have been much more creative and productive than it was thought that they had been. But uh, 2020 is perhaps more connected, artistically speaking, creatively speaking, to what was thought to have been, what was perceived to have been the Middle Ages in terms of creativity. Look it up. First fragrance of these top 10 we're going to go in chronological order. It was released in 1981. Bob Aliano made Giorgio by Giorgio Beverly Hills. Did I pronounce his name? Yeah, Bob Aliano. 1981 sees the launch of a mythical creature. The most, I mean, this is the first one I mentioned, but it's probably also the most, in terms of smell, when you smell it today, it's the one that most than any other catapults you back into the 80s. It's still in production today. And by the way, 
you're going to see uh, most of these that, I'll be, uh, that I will be listing here. You could check out another link underneath this video uh, where I will guide you to my Amazon page where you get to see these perfumes and you can also order them there. So thank you so much for the support if you do that. Uh, Georgia is definitely one of them because it's still in production and the fact that it's still in production means that it's been through so all of the 80s, all of the 90s, the 2000s and the 10s so like, oh, what are we like uh, heading towards 40 years? Oh my God, that's a big birthday. Um, and it's been through reformulations, but the punch it delivered back in the day, the myth wants it that even some restaurants would not let you enter if you were wearing Giorgio by Giorgio Beverly Hills because it was just so powerful. It delivered a punch. And mind you, it was back then. Now with the reformulations and the IFRA regulations, it's a bit different. Today, if you can find it, buy the Made in France version. Not the Made in Spain version, which is the newest version. Not good. Buy the Made in France version. However, the musk, the civet, whatever. Back in the day, they still had the real musk, the real civet in there. It delivered a punch. And I think the fact that they're not in here anymore in their original form, in their synthetic, synthesized form, maybe. Uh, the fact that they're not in here anymore makes this fragrance so much better, I believe. I mean, the Made in France version of uh, this one is maybe two years old. Um, magical. Oh, I just love it so much. And I do not understand the people that say that Giorgio is a terrible perfume. It is not. It is a heavenly, happy, happy, happy creature. Especially in 2020. This will make you feel so light, so happy. All your troubles will be gone. Trust you me. And if you wish to purchase it, the link for my Amazon shop is down there. Now, be careful though. Write the seller. Always ask them, hey, where is it made? If it's made in Spain, don't get it. If it's made in France, get it. If it's made in the US, you can also get it. Also 1981, same year, Chanel gifts us the magic that is Anteus. Anteus by Jacques Polge for Chanel. Here I have the 100 ml, 100 ml eau de toilette version spray. What can I say? This is a heavenly creature. Uh, it is honey and, and resinous woods. And it used to be way more powerful back in the day. It's been reformulated. But Chanel is queen when it comes to fragrances. Even their reformulated perfumes are still done with so much attention to detail, care, and the ingredients are still incredible and impeccable. So, pour monsieur, uh, not pour monsieur, pour monsieur is my favorite male Chanel fragrance, by the way, so I'm always going to mention pour monsieur because I live for pour monsieur, but pour monsieur was made in the 50s. Back to Anteus. Anteus is still magical. It's still incredible. It still delivers a punch for today's day and age. It's much lighter than it used to be in the 80s, but for today's day and age, it's still way more powerful than a lot of other fragrances that are being released today. And if you want that resinousy, woodsy honey and honeysuckle, this is the one for you. It also has sandalwood in it. it, it it's a... how to describe it? Well, just watch my review of it if you want to know how to describe it. I've reviewed this many moons ago and I still love it and I use it a lot still to this date. Another 80s little miracle, uh, miracle fragrance of the 80s. Number three. Now I'm, do I'm going chronological order here. So we did 1981. The next one on our list is 1984. So 82, 83. So two years after, two and a half to three years after that, again, Jacques Polge delivers a punch. 1984 sees the release of Coco. Coco by Chanel. Now this one uh, released as a pure perfume, eau de toilette and eau de parfum. It will see a lot of hmm, a lot of uh, flankers throughout the decades, you know, but the first original one is Coco. After that, we've got uh, Coco Mademoiselle and then uh, Coco Mademoiselle Intense, Coco Mademoiselle Privé. Uh, but Co and Coco also has seen Coco Noir, another flanker. So there is a lot of flankers. Chanel kind of really went there with the flankers of Coco. But the first one, the original one, is 
the cocoa from 1984 in this beautiful ambery liquid. The Bulgarian rose in this one is what makes it and breaks it in the best of terms. It is an opulent oriental, not as intense as Les Exclusives Coromandel would uh, later on become. It would be released in the 2000s. But before Coromandel was released, Coco remained Chanel's most opulent oriental. Uh, it You could say in a way that uh, Coco is the kind of female marketing wise, you know, for me, fragrances know no gender, so it doesn't matter. But in terms of marketing for Chanel standards, Coco was the counterpart, was the female counterpart to the male Anteus, because Anteus was targeted to a male audience and Coco to a female audience. Both of them could be worn by both genders. Today doesn't even really matter anymore. Thank God for that. But um, Coco is was the heavy Chanel Oriental uh, female version of what the Anteus would be as the male version. Coco also kind of is the answer to Yves Saint Laurent's late 70s opium. You could check out my Coco review on my channel. I've also done many videos on Coco, uh, dedicated to Coco. Uh, so you could check out. I have a lot to say on that subject. But anyway, Coco to me is one of the top 10 perfumes of the 80s. Now we're going in chronological order, so I'm not willing to give them just yet their like top, like from worst to best, because they're all amazing. I mean, how can you? These are all perfumes that are entering history. It's the Olympus of, of fragrances of all time, really. Yes, they are from the 80s, but like, how can you classify them? They're all amazing. They we're just at number three. Moving on to number four, from 1984, <laughs> we're going to 1985, and 1985 sees the release of um, Jean Guichard's Obsession. Here I have, wait, this one is, let me just, oops. Yeah, just had to position it because it's so fragile. I don't want it to fall out when I lift the lid. Um, so this one, okay, so you can see, and I'm gonna lift it, oh, delicate. Okay, now we have, this is the pure perfume of Obsession. I mean, this bottle, you guys, Pierre Dinan is the designer of the bottle and Jean Guichard is the perfumer behind. Now, Jean made some amazing perfumes in the 80s, Obsession being the first one that I list today, but there will be more. Um, Calvin Klein, you know, the fact that Obsession came out in 1985, right in the middle of the 80s, it's so, it, it, it's, if we consider the 80s, the 10 year span of the 80s to be like the lifespan of a fragrance on skin. So you could say the beginning of the 80s are the top notes, mid 80s are the heart notes, and then the late 80s are the base notes of a fragrance. We could say that Obsession really hits the heart notes. It hits also the heart of the 80s. It hits the intention of the 80s from the shoulder, the oversized shoulder pads to the amazingly colorful lipstick to the neon colors to, um, color blocking, poppy contrasts of colors and shapes, over the top makeup. It's so interesting how Obsession, you know, this is Calvin Klein's kind of beginning towards what would become grunge later on, especially in the 90s, but Obsession, as explosive and incredible and musky and ambery as it is, oriental in its own respect, it managed to encapsulate the 80s in a clean way, you know, not messy, not all over the, the, the place. It's a, it's a very, very American way of life because Calvin Klein is an American designer, so this is an American release, it's an American fragrance, just like Giorgio uh, Beverly Hills is. It's a mid, like Giorgio is the beginning of the 80s, joie de vivre explosion of American lifestyle. This is the mid 80s explosion of American lifestyle where things get more sophisticated, you know. Um, the style and the look gets more focused. Early 80s still had residue of the 70s in them. And then, you know, slowly with the kind of punk attitude waving in, going in there more and more, it all becomes more focused. The 80s also saw a very big revival of a lot of past epochs and decades. You know, the 40s were also quite big. There's a lot of 40s references in 80s fashion. Check out, for example, what's been done in Dynasty, in the TV show Dynasty. A lot of the styles and fashion we see there are, yes, very 80s, very opulent shoulder pads are like out of the screen, but uh, they're still reminiscent of the 40s. And um, 
this one swipes all of that away. This is a clean 80s scent. This like, it's like Calvin Klein arrived in the mid 80s, swept everything away, all the references to the past and created something new, created a new pedestal on which to build what were to become the 90s. Very clever perfume. Incredible. I still love it today. I actually like pretty much what Coty, uh, Unilever, well, Calvin Klein Cosmetics used to produce and distribute it. Then after that, Unilever, for a certain period of time, um, did the distribution. Now, Coty distributes it. Coty, of course, reformulated it. I do not mind. The Unilever formulation was not good, in my opinion. Coty's formulation that we find today is okay. It bites you a little bit. It's not as creamy deep as the original formulation. Nevertheless, I still love the Coty version. It's still... It's there. The original Obsession DNA is still there, and I still love it, and it's actually, you could get it for a fragment of a price that it used to cost back in the day. So, good job, Koti, at uh, rendering the essence of Obsession still today for 2020. What a wonderful, gorgeous perfume. I mean, wow, the 80s really delivered the, the best there is. Honestly, it's my favorite decade in perfumery, by the way. Well, if we take away the the ten the twenties when Chanel started bringing out Chanel number no. five Chanel number no. twenty two Gardenia Cuir de Russie so the twenties and the eighties those are my my babies my loves all right so we had nineteen eighty five um, another fragrance that defines the times completely the decade of the eighties is our number five fragrance. Uh, it's, uh, it was also released in 1985 by Christian Dior. <laughs> it's poison, of course. What else can it be? And I do have the Esprit de Parfum splash bottle in that little kind of poison apple um, that, that we know so well. You could check out the review of this one on my channel. I've done several videos on poison or poison. Uh, many moons ago, a really long, in-depth uh, review with a lot of different bottles that I have in my collection. I'm obsessed with poison, so I do have a lot of... I've collected a lot of different variations of bottles, concentrations of the Cologne, or the Cologne Light, Esprit de Parfum, the Pure Perfume, super rare, the Eau de Toilettes. Um, so there's a lot to say about Poison, but in fact, I've spoken so many times about it, I'm not going to say too much. Let's just say Poison introduced Plum to the 80s. Opoponax and Plum. In fact, some of the fragrances we're going to uh, see later on in this video, they, they ha will have that... Typical for poison, plum, base. And um, so what's the name of the guy? Ah, oh, yeah. Edouard Fleschier is the nose behind poison. That bottle is a miracle of a bottle. I mean, it's just so genius and brilliant. These little ridges, or you could call these little snaky things, or like claws holding the bottle, are ridges that are supposed to resemble the ridges placed during Edwardian time on glass bottles and apothecary bottles in the pharmacy or doctor bottles that contain poison so that even if you're blind if you touch it you can feel these ridges and you could know ah, okay this bottle contains poison so that's one of the reasons why this one has these ridges as well uh, and of course the apple resembles a poisoned apple there's so much more to say about the design of this bottle but i've made um, a review on that as well you could check out that video too where i talk about my favorite bottle designs throughout perfumery Oh, for the occasion, just to give you a little treat, I often show this if I sh talk about poison. This is my favorite poison bottle. It is the dusting powder. It's called the perfumed dusting powder or the poudre sublime. And uh, it's just so brilliant. They don't make design like this anymore. In fact, all of this has been discontinued. Nowadays, Christian Dior just does the eau de toilette in the bottle, only spray, not splash, in the bottle resembling the apple. The eau de toilette used to come in a flat bottle before, but um, this was the dusting powder. You lift the lid. And inside, you have this Christian Dior puff, and then the powder is there. You lift this other lid, and then, oh my God, it still smells like like the first day it was produced. It's the quality. I mean, I know powders are kind of dangerous and poisonous nowadays. A lot of brands have discontinued them because they have some, allegedly, some cancerogenous elements in them. So I'm kind of very careful. I don't really put this on my body anymore. I smell it from time to time because it's just too good not to. But hey, something's got to kill you. Some people smoke cigarettes. I smell perfumes. What are you going to do? Oh my God, it's delicious. Mm, watering mouth. So this container is just, I mean, no. 
Mm -mm, you can't. You can't beat this. This was the power. This is the luxury that were the 80s. Nowadays, you go to a shop to buy powder. It's going to be some ratchety old box. You're going to be like, why am I even getting this? Okay, moving on. 1986, one year after 1985. And now we're kind of slowly getting into the dry down and the uh, bass notes of this decade. So uh, what do we do? One, two, three, four, five. Number six is... Liz Claiborne, you guys. Liz Claiborne, the nose. Do I have the nose behind Liz Claiborne? Yes, Nicola Calderone or Nicolas Calderone. By the way, Pierre Dinan made the designed the bottle. It's the same guy that designed the Obsession bottle. Also the same guy that designed the Opium by Yves Saint Laurent bottle. Okay, so Liz Claiborne, let me tell you. This is the first fragrance that introduced, and they, again, the 80s were first in all of this. They were the first to do all of these things. It's incredible. 1986 was the year where florals reach the, the, the clean, not even powdery. This is just clean, beautiful shores. Again, an American designer created the American spirit of, of the American dream of the 80s, really. Liz Claiborne delivers on so many levels it is it's like a whiff of fresh air through florals it's like flowers that deliver an ocean breeze and clean powdery a clean powdery touch after you've taken a bath after you've been out on a sandy beach um you know shortly after sun after the sun is setting you come back home you took a bath and you still have that residue of salt, just that like hint of smell of salty ocean on your skin. But you have that bubbly, whatever you use, foam that you use to take a bath on you. So you have that kind of contrast of artificial and natural, which is so 80s because the 80s were all about robots, uh, Tron, um, and enhancing reality, making it, you know, shoulder pads robotic visions of humanity, android visions of humanity. I mean, we're talking, you know, Alien by Ridley Scott was released in the late 70s, but then we got Alien 2. Um, and we have that kind of feeling, almost, again, Ridley Scott, like Blade Runner. We're having a vision of a human that is so happy to be alive and enjoying nature but with all of the artificial enhancements that society and technological advancement has given us that's what Liz Claiborne is to me it's so fresh and natural but also artificial at the same time it's just gorgeous it's just gorgeous it makes you feel like you could do anything that's how good it is and it's it's air a lot of air wonderful wonderful perfume uh from 1986 so this was the sixth one. Now, the seventh one, um, 1987. 1987. Hmm, this is interesting. We have two releases. Let's talk about Moschino first. Moschino's first fragrance. Pierre Dinan, designer of the bottle, just like he designed also Liz Claiborne and Obsession. Pierre Dinan also designed the bottle for Moschino. This is kind of like an Italian wine. The bottle resembles like a good old bottle of wine, Italian wine. This comes with this little thing, the Italian flag kind of you could put on top of it. It's never, it's always detachable. It's, it's not broken. When you purchase the fragrance, it comes with this little bandana thingy. Now, Franco Moschino, what a great designer, what a visionary, uh, what a, you know, he was the first designer that really played also with the concept of politics and fashion and was not afraid to talk about all of the injustices that were in our society, whether it be within fashion or just politics in general. He would not be afraid. He would not shy away from racism and he would talk about it. He would confront it. He would wake people up. He would keep bringing the, the, the subject and the topic up just to make people aware, to wake up. And this is in the 80s where, you know, we just had the explosion of, 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 of HIV and AIDS and uh, there were so many fears and stigmas connected to minority groups all over the world. So you could imagine 
racism was super strong back then too, but it wasn't as rooted within fashion, especially fashion, you know, because done by a white gay guy in Italy. Very rare. Italy in the 80s was still like the sleeping country. They were way back in terms of art and, and style and a lot of things. And in particular, being woke, you know, it's, it's just... Italy had its renaissance, but then now it's kind of... It's like a sleeping beauty. Let's just put it in a nice way. Sleeping beauty. Franco Moschino was one of those rare exponents of the intellectuals and artists, because I, I deem him an artist, not just a designer, more than a designer, an artist, that really did Italy good. And it's a pity that we lost him so soon, unfortunately, to AIDS. But uh, he definitely delivered that waking up punch, whether it be through his fragrances, ad campaigns, marketing. I mean, I remember there's this one gorgeous scarf, silk foulard with uh, a Jesus that is being kind of like, you know, he's on the cross and the Jesus is black not white. And uh, this was a huge shocking thing for Italy back then, you know, but he's like, well, think about it, guys. Wake up. Wake up to the truth, you know. And he was incredible. Incredible. Perfumes too. However, I have to say, Moschino's first fragrance does have a reminiscence of Calvin Klein's obsession. In fact, we're just, what are we, two years in? Two years after Obsession was released. <coughs> Sorry, guys. I need some water. Um, Moschino is... It's like, it's the sister of Obsession. You you can feel that there's... That Obsession has had a huge success. And Moschino loved it. <laughs> and this is kind of Moschino's interpretation of Obsession, I would say. It is its own fragrance as well. Euro Italia is the manufacturer of it, still to date. You can find it still in production, and Euro Italia is still producing it, also available on Amazon, so you can check it out through my link. Um, in fact, I got this bottle from Amazon too. I have to say, it's gorgeous in its own right. I have reviewed it as well, so you could check the review out as well. But it's not as original as I'm actually used to seeing creations from Franco Moschino. But just because we know Obsession and it came out two years prior. Um, this is 1987. Another 1987. So this is number um, seven. Yeah. Number eight, also from 1987, and also not as original, even though we love it so much, is Cacharel's Lulu. Now, you know I love my Lulu, and whoever follows me on Instagram, so predictable spelled together, you know I live for this perfume. However... Let's be honest for a second. Here I have the original formulation. I also have uh, the current, new, reformulated version of Lulu. This is a very rare example where I have to say I prefer the reformulated version to the original. A lot of people are going to say, we love the original, we love the original. Yeah, it's great, but here's the but. Lulu, in its original formulation, keyword plum, 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 plum. Yes, there's tuberos in here too, but this is all about the plum. It is Cacharel's answer to Christian Dior's poison. In fact, if you do smell the original formulations of, of both of them, you could smell out how, a you know, what was this again? Uh, poison, 1985, Lulu, 1987. You could smell out that Lulu is the 87, 1987, further development of plum and perfumery. It's like a more modernized version of poison. So it's Cacharel's answer to poison, if you may. They are different enough, of course, but I can see how poison influenced Lulu, how poison influenced the 1987 Lulu. This is one of my favorite bottles of all time, by the way. It reminds me of a Star Wars spaceship. Uh, I always say this, a lot of people think that... Um, the genie kind of bottle shape is the original. This came later. No, the genie bottle is the splash version of Lulu. Uh, this spaceship, kind of Star Wars spaceship, um, 80s spaceship design vehicle is has been from day one, from the launch of Lulu, the spray bottle for Lulu. So the genie thing is the splash bottle. This is the spray bottle. Both were released at the same time. I prefer the spray bottle. A lot of people don't like it. I think this is a beautiful, beautiful, brilliant, brilliant uh, design of a bottle. Now, um, 
the Jean Guichard is the design is the designer is the nose behind Lulu. He's also the nose behind Obsession. Um, so he will make some incredible again. Obsession was incredible. Lulu is also incredible, but again, to me, it's as if Cacharel told him, "Hey, make something that's kind of similar to the huge success that Christian Dior had with Poison." And in fact, Lulu was a huge success. But what Lulu is today in the reformulated version, and now that you see, is amazing because as deep as this one is in its OG version. The resins and the ambers and all of those, uh, just the plummy, sticky, cloying resins are so dark. They cover up all the floral aspect of Lulu. Lulu also has tuberose in it, right? In the current formulation, that's watered down, toned down. Yes, L'Oréal, who owns Cacharel, uh, L'Oréal wants to just prof, you know, maximize profits the profit margin as much as they can. Lulu is considered a cheapie. You can get it for very low cost. You can also get this through the link, through my Amazon link, by the way, also down there in the description box. You'll see, you can, you're can you going to see the price is really low for what it is. But L'Oréal, who's producing Lulu now, managed to create something in the current formulation by cheapening it down. What they did in reality is they allowed my nose to sense out the flowers much more, which I love for Lulu. So the current formulation of Lulu is a light, light-hearted, younger version of the 80s Lulu. The plum is now toned down. The resins and the cloying darkness is gone. It's like all the clouds have left Lulu's realm, and now we only have light and clean, powdery, delicately, delicately sweet florals. And that tuberose finally comes to bloom. It's amazing. So kudos to you, L'Oreal. You probably did it just because you wanted to save some money and you thought, ha those suckers out there, they're going to buy Lulu and they won't even know that we've cheapened the formula. <laughs> Boo, we know you're cheapening the formula. We know how greedy you are. We know it's all about the money for you. We know you don't give a crap about the heritage of this fragrance at all. And if you could, you would probably just take it off the market altogether because it doesn't fit your notion of what... A, just go check out Cacharel Perfumes Instagram. It's just, it's like built artificially to suit like modern day influencers. I'm like, well, first of all, this whole influencer shtick is over. Give me a minute for a rant here. Uh, and all the brands that are now jumping on that wagon, girl, you're like seven years too late. Quit with it. Influencers are nothing but yay, yes saying people who never have a critical opinion because they're super scared that if they do have an honest opinion about something, they will never be put on another PR list again or they would be taken off all of the PR list. So why the heck do you need an influencer? I'm not talking to you, Brands. I would never trust a person who always says, yes, this is great, this is great, this is great. Oh my God, this is amazing. Oh my God, this is amazing. Buy this, buy this, buy this. This is amazing, this is amazing. What are you, a clown, a robot? No, I, I do not trust people like that at all. People who come to me and tell me every day, I see them, hi, how are you doing? Everything is great. I'm like, stop right there. Can I talk to you as a real human being? If you're not feeling well, I want to know it. Because honestly, that's more interesting and more real to me than having to deal with questions typical for America. Hi, how are you today? Nobody gives a crap about how you are doing today. They don't want to know how you are today. So quit asking the question. You want to know how I'm doing today? I'm going to tell you how I'm doing today. It ain't really good. And I'm going to go into it. There are days when I do feel good. But then, <laughs> but then usually when you react like that to a person that stays asking, how are you doing? They go and tilt because they don't expect you to tell them how you're really doing because they don't really care. All right. Moving on to 1988. We're almost at the end of our journey. The ninth fragrance released in 1988 is Elizabeth Taylor's Passion. Ah, and we're really hitting the dry down of this decade because Passion, from the second you smell it, all the way to its dry down, it's intense, deep, it's purple. I mean, the color purple, like Elizabeth Taylor's eyes, the color purple, the bleh, the col if the color purple had a smell, it would be Passion, most luckily. Lulu comes very close to purple as well. But, uh, I mean, Passion is a completely synthetic concoction. <laughs> it is the epitome of shoulder pads. It is the epitome of Dynasty. It is the epitome of Dallas. It is the epitome 
of everything glitzy and diamondy and also fake diamondy that America had to offer another American fragrance. In fact, America was pretty darn good at kicking up, delivering the punch in the 80s in terms of perfumes because most of the perfumes listed uh, in my top 10 perfumes of the 80s are from America. Then we have a couple of them. Three of them are from uh, France. Four of them are from France, being Anteus, Coco, Poison, and Lulu. So four are from France, and one is from Italy, being Moschino. And um, and America has one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Yeah, and we're going to have five. The last one is also going to be American. So America takes the cake in terms of 80s. Of course it does. I mean... America, America is the symbol of the 80s, and the 80s are a symbol of America. Let's be honest, that pop culture exploded exponentially in America in the 80s. And it's still today, the ripple effect is being felt across the globe in terms of pop culture influence, and also perfumes and fashion too. So Elizabeth Taylor definitely seals the deal in the 80s, 1988, with passion, with this powdery, resinous, ambery, musky, deep, deep purple, almost black, just like the bottle is, fragrance. And then the 10th perfume, also uh, from 1988, it's, it's an interesting one because the 10th perfume also, so all of these fragrances, right, were uh, developed by men. At least men took the credit for them. But all of this is about to change, you guys, because as we exit the 80s and slowly enter the 90s, women take charge, as it should be. Because also in perfumery, just like in fashion many times, I love my Coco, and also because she's a woman, but also because she's a genius. And I love Vivian Westwood. They're my favorite designers. You see, they're all women. Here we have a female, and uh, Sophia, oh God, Greismann. Sophia, sorry if I butchered your name, but Calvin Klein comes to us again in 1988 and takes the cake again, makes the freshness. You remember what I said about obsession, how... pulls everything together and it made perfumery kind of, it made the 80s veer off of that retro vibe that the 80s are so famous for, for the 40s and 50s in particular. Here he totally swipes away everything that the 80s were, unfortunately in a way, but the 90s are also going to be amazing. But definitely 1988 with the release of Eternity, Calvin Klein delivers, wow, magic. This is pure magic. And I do have a very rare example of the pure perfume of Eternity. Now, this is not a sample. This is the actual perfume in seven milliliter. Look, okay, let me just show you how amazing this is. This is how we open the, oh God, I'm goosebumps. Okay, so I've received it. So it comes in this outer box that opens up like this. So you see this. It's like a little harmonica effect. They didn't have to do it, but they did it because they could. Those were the 80s. And then inside is another box. Cardboard. Strictly cardboard. Calvin Klein is almost never plastic. This is all like beautiful cardboard papers with a particular... Um, there's... Um, how would you call it? There's a texture to the paper. It's not cheap. It's wonderfully done, executed deliciously. And then I don't want it to fall out. Inside we have the queen of the end of the 80s, our dry down that kind of eliminates the shoulder pads and brings us to the, to the 90s slowly. This is the pure perfume splash bottle of Eternity by Calvin Klein in its satin, silky satin bed. This is a little pouch thing here. It's like soft and silky. It's a silk material and it's padded. And it's... I think this is crystal. It definitely feels like crystal. This 7 ml, oh my gosh, it's just the way it kind of escapes from the stopper. Oh, I'm so lucky to have found this full new pristine bottle of the Pure Perfume. The first release of Eternity. Calvin Klein was so sure of himself. This is so amazing. This is one of the rare examples where the perfume bottle doesn't even have the name of the fragrance printed, etched on it. He wanted purity of lines, purity of shape, purity of smell. In fact, this is the purest fragrance you can have in the 80s. It's just floral to the highest, utmost, maximum degree. The, the 
Obsession still had the amber oriental kind of resinousy touch to it. All of that is gone. Here we are, no amber resins, just flowers that you wouldn't even think of mixing together. Sophia mixed them together and delivered in 1988 a fragrance that just blows your mind, blows your blows my mind. It is the most, it's the cleanest perfume ever, but clean is usually associated to just soapy, simple. It's hard to deliver a clean smell that is complicated and sophisticated, and that's exactly what Eternity is. It's not simple at all. The purity of lines, no need for a logo, no need for a name, nothing. You know what it is when you smell it, you know what it is when you see it, and there's no need for a logo on it. How freaking amazing is that? So I think I prepared here just <coughs> a little for the text. So just to let you know, <coughs> sorry guys, I need to drink some water. Um, Lily of the Valley, well, the Lily of the Valley. We It opens up with citrus, green notes, followed by the note of violet, Lily of the Valley, carnation, spicy carnation. Um, there's a peppery accord in it. Final notes are gentle with powdery heliotrope, pink sandalwood, transparent, musky note, transparent. You see, the musk is not heavy anymore. It's a, there is no musk. It's like a transparent, it's almost as if it's a vision of what Olivier Polge would do with the variety of musks he used just a year ago when he released 1957, Chanel's, or two years ago, 19, Chanel's 1957 from his exclusives, like that whole assembly of musks, of highly synthetic musks. This one, it's as if this one is already delivering us a letter from the future and is saying, this is what's going to happen, you guys. Except 1957 never reaches the lightness, the airiness of, of, of this floral with just a hint of this transparent musk, which, whatever it is, you can't beat it. It's impossible to beat. Today's version of uh, Eternity in the Eau de Parfum form by Coty is good, but try hunting down. I mean, you can also get the Eau de Parfum from the 80s and 90s, um, but the pure perfume... This is number 10, and this concludes the top 10 80s fragrances, at least as far as Jacob is concerned. I mean, everybody's going to have their preferences. Uh, mind you, this selection was made also bearing in mind that to me, perfumes know no gender. So the fact that 9 out of 10 were marketed to women, 1 out of 10 was marketed to men doesn't mean anything. To me, if they're marketed to men or women, it's just a flaw of the system. <laughs> they should all be unisex. So, and they are. So thank you guys so much for watching. Follow me on Instagram, Super Deco All Spell Together, if uh, you don't already. I also have um, new two new Instagram profiles dedicated only to Chanel. One is Coco Chanel is in my house, where I talk only about Chanel the brand and my collection and the archives. And then there's Coco Chanel Privé. All spelled together where I pay homage and uh, keep the memory of Coco Chanel, the woman alive, uh, posting photos about her life all up to 1971, which is the date when she died. So you can get to see as if she was still alive today. So I, I'm trying to keep her memory alive. Coco Chanel, the woman is quite different from Chanel, the brand. So those two profiles you're going to see, they're very, very different. And uh, other than that, I would like to thank my patrons. Thank you so much for helping the channel, sustaining it and letting it grow. On Patreon, I'm Super Deco Well Spelled Together. You get to see videos there before they come to YouTube. They're all ad-free on Patreon. And of course, also you get to see videos that are exclusive to Patreon that never come to YouTube. Thank you guys so much. Until next time, never forget to never give up on love. Love you all. See you soon. Take care. Bye.